I want to share a couple passages of Scripture with you today. <clears throat> the first, from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, I'll be reading from the first chapter, verses 17 through 21, and then from the Gospel according to St. John from the 21st chapter. Listen now for the Word of God for you. Paul writes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And now these words from John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Let us pray. Dear God, in the midst of the confusion and the clutter and the chaos that surrounds our lives, help us to feel your presence near to us today. Slow us down, if only for a little while. Draw us up onto your lap. Hold us close, even as you whisper to us those wonderful words that lead to life. Speak, Lord. For we, your servants, are listening. Amen. Well, it was the 10th inning, game six, the 1986 World Series between the Boston Red Sox and the New York Mets. With two outs already in the books and Ray Knight of the Mets on second base, into the batter's box stepped Mookie Wilson, the speedy center fielder for the Mets, who hit a weak ground ball towards Red Sox first baseman Bill Buckner. It was simply a foregone conclusion that Buckner would scoop up the ball, touch first base, the game would move on to the 11th inning. But that routine grounder scooted ever so gently under the glove of Bill Buckner and into the outfield. Ray Knight galloped home like a modern-day Paul Revere to score the winning run, and the rest, as they say, is history. The Mets went on to win Game 7, and for 33 years, Bill Buckner was considered one of baseball's biggest scapegoats, the man who cost the Red Sox a World Series after decades upon decades of futility. When the name Bill Buckner is mentioned, every baseball fan has the image of the ground ball that got away. Seldom does anyone mention that only 52 players in the history of the game have gotten more hits than Bill Buckner did. Only 39 players have played more games. When it comes to Buckner's legacy, captured in photographic form on the front of your bulletin, it seems that his entire major league career is defined by one moment. It is defined 
by an error. Bill Buckner died two years ago at age 69 from Lewy body dementia. And his death somehow crystallized for me how often we suffer from what I call the Bill Buckner syndrome, the defining of a person by their mistakes and by their errors. Though in many cases they regret what they've done, we won't let them forget it. Do you have a person in your life like that where the very mention of their name conjures up the time they messed up, did something to upset or disappoint you? When we see these people, seldom if ever do we ever see any good that's there. Instead, we only see their brokenness, their flaws, their mistakes. We don't see them for who they are or who they could be. We see them for who they're not. So perhaps the first point of the day for us to ponder is this one. Who are the Bill Buckners of your life? Those who you define by their errors. And might it be time to see them in a different light? While it's been my experience that many of us are afflicted with the Bill Buckner syndrome, it's also been my experience that the syndrome doesn't stop with how we view others. A lot of times we look in the mirror and all we see is Bill Buckner. All we see are our errors, our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our mistakes. I remember fondly the words of one of my favorite philosophers, Lucy Van Pelt of Charlie Brown fame. After planting herself under a fly ball only to watch it hit her glove and then hit the ground, Lucy turned to Charlie Brown and said, you know, I'm sorry I missed that, Charlie Brown. I thought I had it, but just as I was about to catch it, I suddenly remembered all the other fly balls I had missed. I guess you could say that the past got in my eyes. Now, how many times, even to this day, does the past get in your eyes? You're haunted by whispers from days gone by. Not smart enough, not attractive enough, not good enough. You're haunted by those people in your life who were and are only too glad to point out and hold up your Bill Buckner moments for all the world to see. And that's why today's scripture lesson from Ephesians is so very important for you to hear. I pray Ephesians 1 over you all, all the time. Your worst moments are not who you are. Every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, I hold this directory in my hands. It's a church directory, and I pray these words. May the Father give my people wisdom and revelation so they may know him better. May the eyes of their hearts be enlightened so they may know hope and the riches of their inheritance and the incomparably great power that resides within them, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. To a doubting and discouraged church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul wrote those words two millennia ago to the people of the Bill Buckner syndrome. He speaks those words today. Paul's words come to life brilliantly in the words of the ever so wise theologian Henry Nouwen. We are not what we do. We are not what we have. We are not what others think of us. Coming home is claiming this truth. I am a beloved child of God. When I think about hope, when I think about new life in the light of our Bill Buckner moments, my mind takes me to one of my favorite movies, a little gem entitled City Slickers. You might remember it. There's an absolutely riveting scene where three lifelong best friends are discussing the state of their lives. One of them, a guy named Phil Berquist, played by Daniel Stern, is in tears. Because of his infidelity, 
he has lost his wife, and because the store he manages belongs to his father-in-law, he's also lost his job. Now with tears in his eyes and his head in his hands, he tells his two best friends, my life is over, I'm a failure. I have nothing more to live for. And one of his friends, Mitch Robbins, played by my guy, Billy Crystal, responds by saying this, Phil, that's just not true. Your life is not over unless you decide that it's over. Remember when we were kids and we would play ball and someone would hit the ball and it would get stuck in a tree and we'd all yell, do over, do over. Then we get the ball out of the tree and do that play all over again. Your life isn't over, Phil. You get a do-over. Now, your life will never be the same as it once was, but you do have a chance to turn your life around. Our gospel lesson, John 21, points us fully in the direction of that truth. Ours is a Bible, ours is a gospel that is chock full of second chance do-over people. And no one knows that better than the disciple upon whom Jesus chose to build his church, Simon Peter. Peter is fiery. He's fiercely determined. He is a force to be reckoned with among the disciples. Many times, like a lot of folks I know, but nobody in here, His mouth engages before his mind does. But his faith is so profound that Jesus himself tells Peter in Matthew 16, your faith is like a rock. Upon you, I will build my church. The gates of hell will never prevail against it. Ten chapters later, Jesus is speaking to the disciples at the Last Supper, and he says, you will all become deserters of me this night. And Peter, filled with righteous indignation, says, all these other saps might desert you. I will never desert you. Before the night's over, Peter denies Christ not once, not twice, but three times. Any of you ever been there before? So full of well-meaning bravado, a little bit of spiritual swagger, only to see the shadow side of yourself emerge as you betray the very values or the very people that you profess to hold dear? Those are the moments that it's next to impossible to see a way out, knowing that you have blown it big time. Now, all of that context helps you to understand Peter's trepidation when it comes to walking the beach with Jesus after their breakfast buffet. In Peter's mind, he is the Bill Buckner of the disciples, the one who dropped the ball for Jesus when Jesus needed him the most. He is convinced that he will be forever defined by an error. Now, Jesus knows this. And as they walk along next to the lapping waves, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? That's one question for each betrayal, for each mistake, for each error. I rather imagine Jesus ask us the same thing after each time we let him down, whether it's through our denials, through our actions or our inaction. And each question, every time it's asked, is an invitation back into relationship with him. Do you love me, Carol? Do you love me, Leslie? Do you love me, Roger? Do you love me, Jeff? Do you love me, Bob? If you do, then we can work this out. It's an invitation to not be defined by your mistakes and your sin. And it's a challenge to not define others in that very same way. A few weeks into my first appointment, some 34 years ago now, I met Bill. 
Bill was one of those folks that people in the church warned you about. Be careful with him, dude. He is a loose cannon. His demeanor had grown crusty and cantankerous, particularly in his later years. Often a simple, how you doing, could lead to an argument. He was possessed by a whole lot of law, a whole lot of judgment, not a whole lot of grace. I got to know Bill fairly well over the course of the next few years, but I always had the feeling there was something he wasn't telling me. There was a distance in his soul. But then, then something happened. Over the course of a two-month period, I began to see this change in countenance physically in Bill. His face, his expressions in worship changed. And while curiosity might have killed the cat, so far as I know, it hasn't killed any preachers yet, so I went to visit him. All I had to do was ask, what's happened? And we were off to the races. It hit me, it hit me in the service about 10 weeks ago, he said, when we were saying the Apostles' Creed. And for those of you who've never said the Creed, pretty common in the Methodist Church, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may not know this, Bob, he said, because very few people do know it. But my only son was killed by a drunk driver 30 years ago. For the longest time, I've just been mad as mad could be, and I wanted to blame everybody and everything. Every time you preachers started to talk about forgiveness, I thought to myself, that is just a bunch of bull. Come and walk in my shoes for a while and then see what you think. You have no flipping, my word, not his, idea, what you're talking about. About two and a half months ago, we were saying the creed in church, and we said the line, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And it swept over me like a tidal wave. I've said the Apostles' Creed thousands of times, but I never thought about what that one sentence meant for me. I've been content to think about this drunk driver as the worst sinner I know. I've spent 30 years trying to change something that can't be changed. And in the process of wanting his life to be ruined, just like he ruined my son's, I've ended up ruining my own. When we affirmed our faith that Sunday morning a few months ago, for the very first time I realized that unless I handed over my hurt, my anger, my pain to God and put the man who killed my son squarely in God's hands, that I was going to die miserable and quite possibly die unforgiven. So I went home and wrote the driver a letter of forgiveness. And I wept as I wrote. Two weeks later, I got a letter that said, you have no idea how much this means to me. Every day when I look in the mirror, I remember what I've done. I will live with it for the rest of my life. But your letter gives me hope that maybe God will use me to help somebody who feels like their mistakes and their errors and their sin and their past are too big to be forgiven. Bill clouded up with tears. When I got that letter, Bob, I felt healed. I felt whole for the first time in 30 years.
when I got back to the church office after that visit, I took a look at the bulletin for Bill Martin's Come to Jesus Sunday. The words of the closing hymn read like this. This is a day of new beginnings. Time to remember and move on. Time to believe what love is bringing, laying to rest the pain that's gone. Now let us with the Spirit's daring step from the past and leave behind our disappointment, our guilt, and our grieving, seeking new paths, sure to find. Because Christ is alive and goes before us to show, to share what love can do. This is a day of new beginnings. For our God is making all things new. As it was with Bill Martin, so can it be for you. Step from the past this morning. Leave behind your disappointment, your guilt, your grieving. Christ is alive. He goes before you to show you, to share with you what love can do. Through this bread, through this cup, our God is making all things new.